everybody bringing compliments from the USA. I am in Michigan, attended the obesity week meeting and gave a keynote address on like mother, like daughter. Very much related to what we are going to discuss, which is this story of the impact phenotype. And as part of this presentation, I would like to reiterate that Diabetes Unit KEM Pune is the only department in the world of diabetes where mother and baby is the logo. And our new logo visualizes modern Ganesh, who instead of traveling on the back of this mouse, clicks the mice and moves fast. So whatever we are going to discuss is about intrauterine programming and rapid transition that has happened in India over the last few decades. And we have a number of collaborators from India and abroad who actually have helped us. So I always like to quote Paolo Coelho's statement in Alchemist that the world conspires to help you or the universe conspires to help you when you want to do something. I wrote my confessions as a thin fat Indian in 2017 in European Journal of Clinical Nutrition. And it was to tell the postdocs that you can do good research even though you are not a specialist. So I am not an epidemiologist, nutritionist, pediatrician, obstetrician, body compositionist, but you will see that all of these have contributed to our findings. And therefore, I say it's really the magic, not the logic, which gives you interesting stories, though it's not the classic ideas in the science. So what is the thin fat phenotype? It's a comparative body composition of Indians with respect to Europeans. So that for a given weight or for a given BMI, Indians have lower lean mass and higher fat mass expressed as percentage and therefore higher risk of diabetes and I dare say other non-communicable diseases which are linked with adiposity. And it's very important to remember that it's a comparative body composition. And the story started when I was training at the BJ Medical College Pune and the Sassoon General Hospitals and working as the registrar of the professor and conducting the diabetes unit between 1977 and 1981. I made some observations based on very basic measurements, which was measuring the height, measuring the weight, calculating BMI with a log table, that the textbook descriptions of what was then called adult onset or obesity associated diabetes was actually very different in Indians. Our patients in Sassoon Hospital were all thin, lower socioeconomic class, but were type 2 diabetes patients. And then I went to Oxford to train in diabetes and was part of many studies as a collaborator, including Sigma study, which is the one version of OMA study. And what I realized was compared to the Englishman, though I was only 55 kg compared to my registrar 85 kg, and I had a body mass index of 20 instead of 26 in him, my glucose and insulin concentrations were higher. And that is the idea came to me that despite being thin, we are likely to have higher risk of diabetes and it was soon confirmed in the South Hall survey. And that is when the idea came to me that we need to really discuss this, okay, why we have increased risk at a lower BMI. Came back to India, set up the welcome diabetes study. Dr. Shergekar was my right hand and we constructed actually figures. This was what we constructed that time that two hour glucose during an OGTT in our population was the highest in those who had the lowest BMI, but highest waist hip ratio as a measure of central obesity. Incidentally, we were the first one to measure central obesity in Indians 
in 1980s. So I had added this tape to my armamentarium and we had this skinfold calipers which also told us that the subscapular to tricep skinfold ratio in our patients was much higher compared to the English patients though our patients were younger, had a lower BMI, had a lower mid-arm circumference. So if you have very simple instruments still you can make very interesting findings. So we just, this was the beginning of the thin fat Indian and that fatness was that time measured as a waist to hip ratio or subscapular to tricep skin fold ratio. I started measuring body fat much later when I learned about it and when I had enough grants to measure it. And very soon people picked this up so that Mary Ann Banerjee published a report on 22 of her Asian colleagues in the Brooklyn State University of New York, SUNY New York, compared to African Americans that for each BMI, Indians had higher body fat percent. And a very noted sort of specialist in body composition, Paul Durenberg and Mabel Yap Durenberg in Singapore showed that Indians have higher body fat percentage and other South Asians have higher body fat percentage compared to the white Caucasians. So WHO invited a panel, expert panel. I was one of the invitees along with uh, uh, Dr. Reddy from who's now in PHFI and Anura Kurpad, a very noted nutritionist from Bangalore. And what we decided was that the public health action points for BMI are different for different populations. For Southeast Asians, it was 23 and for Pacific Islanders, it was 37.5, which means that we had similar risk of diabetes at 23 compared to 37 in Pacific Islanders and 27.5 in white Caucasians. But we never said to change the definition of obesity. <coughs> that would cause a lot of confusion. And for that article, I thought I had a picture which would give that message very clearly and therefore I sort of worked on publishing this paper in the same issue of Lancet where the expert committee report was also published. And that's the famous YY paradox, Yajnik, Yurkin paradox. Yadnik and Yurkin, two principal investigators in the crisis study, which measured body composition in Indians by five different techniques, by just pure chance had same BMI, 22.3. Very surprising that we had same BMI. But on the DEXA, John's body fat percent was 9%, I was 21%. And that is how the YY paradox came. As you know, this is a very frequently shown picture and I said now instead of the basics, I have used a 40,000 pound machine. So this picture was worth actually 40,000 pounds, which today would mean many millions of rupees. Everyone said it must be genetic and we have actually a lot of now information on polygenic inheritance of obesity and adiposity. And the latest very comprehensive review by Ruth Luce in 2021 in Nature says combined these genome-wide significant loci explain 6% of the variation in BMI. That means large part of variation and so-called heritability remain unexplained. And a very interesting thing happened around between like say 1975 and 1995, three seminal papers which actually gave us a lead into what is the reason for that unexplained irritability. First report was in Dutch winter hunger uh, study. So this is a period in the history of Dutch people towards the end of the Second World War when Germans cut off the food supply so that everyone was on 600 calories per day diet for six months. So women who were pregnant at that time also were severely undernourished. If the women were undernourished in the third trimester, their offspring at 
army conscription age, that's 18 years, were less obese, the red line. If the women were exposed in the first two trimester, their babies were more obese. So very interesting finding that depending on the window in pregnancy, when the malnutrition happens, you can end up either more or less obese compared to the population which is not exposed to undernutrition. Around same time, studies in Pima Indian showed that exposure to overnutrition in diabetic pregnancies meant that their children were more obese as early as 5 to 9 years and certainly around pubertal and young adult age. And that was the gestational overnutrition story which Pedersen and Frankel summarized as nutrient-mediated teratogenesis. Then came the famous David Barker's paper where he showed low birth weight is a risk factor for future diabetes. And all these things combine to actually tell me that something is happening during intrauterine life, either undernutrition or overnutrition, which both seem to drive the epidemics of obesity, adiposity and diabetes in different populations. So thin fat phenotype actually is an example of thrifty phenotype of David Barker. It's a case of structural teratogenesis as per the Norbert Frankel terminology. And this information was obtained a little bit later by our research in Pune birth cohorts. That is the Pune maternal nutrition study where you know now I am not going to go into details. Time is short today. We have followed up women from before they became pregnant, during pregnancy, and then the women, their husband and the children for now 25 years. And we have extensive information on child's growth collected every six months for 18 years and extensive metabolic, cardiovascular, neurocognitive information on the whole family every six years. And now we are completing the backlog which was left by the COVID. And we have a very impressive biobank, which allows us to do various molecular studies in this life course data collection. And the mothers were quite thin, 18.1 kg at the beginning of pregnancy in 1993. Babies were born only 2.7 kg. I mean, today Indian average birth weight is 2.8 kg. And many of them, depending on which reference you use, was SGA, small for gestational age. These mothers were predominantly vegetarian. They ate less calories and proteins than recommended, large carbohydrate component of the diet, less micronutrient intake rich foods, substantial physical activity, a typical Indian village scenario. And we found gestational diabetes very rare at that time in that population. But micronutrient deficiency, especially B12, quite rampant, not folate. Iron was also deficient and vitamin D borderline. And when I compared these babies born in Pune with babies born in Southampton, we had very stunning findings. I asked David Barker. What do you think? Indian baby, which is very small, will it have more fat or less fat? So he said, it's obvious they will have less fat. I knew he was going to be wrong, which he was. So we showed it very clearly when we compared the anthropometry of Indian babies with English babies and showed that though Indian babies were smaller in all the measurements, there was a hierarchy such that the fat measurements were the best result. So this zero line is an average English baby. And each bar is the standard deviation deficit in Indian babies. Deficit was least for subscapular skin fold, then less for triceps skin fold. And when we did what is called pair matching, equal birth weight comparison, Indian babies had smaller birth length, then they had smaller mean arm circumference, but substantially more subscapular skin fold, even larger. And they had higher leptin and insulin concentrations in the cord blood. So we knew that what we had observed in adults was present from birth 
and therefore it must originate during intrauterine growth and development. So this is the thin fat Indian baby. And of course, people don't believe you when you come from Pune, India. They said, how can you measure such complex anthropometry? Who are you? You are not a nutritionist, etc. So we went to the black box of MRI. 30 babies born in Pune, 30 babies born in uh, Imperial College London, collaboration with Nina Modi. And what we showed to our own amazement that these small babies had larger subcutaneous compartment fat and larger visceral compartment fat compared to English babies, which is not obvious to the eye. So very amazing, striking finding. And this is what again convinced the people. Then a whole lot of papers have been published. I've just shown you here from UK, from Canada, from Suriname, from Southeast Asia, number of places that Indian babies are in fact. So I'm going to ask you now an interesting question. Some of you who are as fond of Winnie the Pooh as I am will know that this is the 100 wood acre. There is Christopher Robin, there is Owl, there is Kangaroo, there is Tigger, there is Piglet, Winnie the Pooh, Rabbit and Eeyore. And Christopher is conducting a spelling competition. And he has asked them to spell adiposity. So Eeyore has spelled it as adipo city. He thinks it's a city. So I am going to ask you a question. Okay, of all the animals which are in this picture, which animal was the most adipose at birth? So think about it and see whether you get it right. This is something very dramatic finding in comparative body composition. If a small human baby has the highest fat content percent at birth compared to all other mammals, including pig, which is just 2%, human is 15%. So there must be some importance of this fat for survival. And that, I think, is a very dramatic observation. Is this only an Indian phenomenon? I was getting stumped because some of my papers were coming back. They said, this is for India. What is this use for the rest of the world? So I decided to look for cohorts and found a cohort of twins and singletons in Guinea-Bissau. This is collaboration with Morton from Copenhagen, Denmark, who did a PhD on this cohort. And he had anthropometric data and glucose data. And what we showed was that twins are thinner and fatter compared to the singletons. So as you know, twins have to occupy that same space. They are smaller. They are relatively undernourished compared to singletons. And they are thinner and fatter. That to me tells that it's intrauterine nutrition rather than being Indian which actually drives this, Indians have an extreme form. Is there any genetics? Yes, there must be genetics. Ultimately, everything is driven by genetics. So Anup Mishra's group published about myostatin gene as a determinant of body composition, which it is, of course, true. Then there are all other sort of studies. We did a gene risk study for birth weight in number of cohorts from India, Bangladesh and migrant Indians and Bangladeshis in London, compared them with babies born in the UK. And we have also done FTO gene studies. And this is the paper of the GIFTS consortium where we compared birth weight in Indian Bangladeshi babies with English babies. So birth weight for each gene risk score, as you can see on the x-axis, Birth weight is on the y-axis. So for each gene risk score, Indian babies have lower birth weight. In other words, they have the genetic potential, which is equivalent at each gene risk score, but their phenotype is smaller. This to me tells a classic genotype phenotype development phenomenon and tells me that a number of environmental factors which are either missing or present in excess are interfering with 
achieving the genetic potential of growth in utero for the Indian babies. Very classic paper. Last year we published it. There is a historical background. Over last like 150 years from 1830 to 1980, where data is available, Europeans put on 15 centimeters in height. Indians and Southeast Asians put either zero or some of them had actually lost it for the time. So these are the occupied countries which face severe political, financial, nutritional deficits. They did not put on any height. And this cartoon says here, ki, I forgot to grow in height and therefore I am fat. That's very true for the Indian and Southeast Asian populations. And Jonathan Wales and I wrote this paper about the capacity load model where capacity is built up by the lean mass and load by the fat mass. This imbalance between the Europeans and the Indians explains the higher risk of diabetes. Barry Popkin is also one of our co-authors. Now new things have come up in the last few years and I have to thank basically Sandeep Mathur from JD. He has pursued this thin fat phenotype molecular biology like nobody else. And he has explained various like say genetic associations by doing transcriptome in the adipose tissue, in the central fat as well as peripheral fat. And he has now highlighted the gene sort of uh, structures or the network, sorry, which are associated with this phenomenon. And now recently he is talking about partial lipodystrophy related phenotype which of course we had described first in our original paper where triceps and subscapula were differentially affected, but he is now doing more work. So there is an element of loss of fat in the legs and the arms and more fat in the center, a typical lime on the stick phenotype, which actually originally was described in Cushing's disease. And we have interesting information on that. But Sandeep has contributed quite a lot to this. New information about brown adipose tissue, which now is attracting attention all over. And to cut the story short, despite having higher waist hip ratio, higher fat mass percent, Indians have lower brown fat compared to the Caucasian patients. Very nice study published from uh, Holland with advanced techniques of measuring the brown adipose tissue. So the thin fat thing is now becoming more complex. And we are now into very exciting research by measuring adipocyte derived exosomes, the small vesicles in the mother and the baby and trying to see whether the miRNA content of these exosomes is in any way related to the adiposity of the baby. This paper is uploaded on MedArchive just last week. And what is interesting is that mother and cord blood have differentially expressed miRNAs in adipose compared to the fat baby pregnancies. But the pathways are so remarkably similar between mother and baby that they concentrate or they target various signaling pathways in the adipose tissue, which are associated with either increased adipogenesis, adipocyte dysfunction, or other adipocyte abnormalities sort of, of metabolism. And this is a very exciting new field which we will follow up and already we have additional exciting results. Finally, a few weeks ago, someone sent me this paper and that someone is going to speak next in this meeting. That is Shashank from Mumbai, a dear friend, prolific reader, very intelligent person. And he sends me, greets me one day morning at 5.30 by sending this paper that early life vitamin B12 orchestrates lipid peroxidation to ensure reproductive success 
in C elegans, which is a very useful nematode which is used in research and has won many Nobel Prizes for different people. And very interesting that even in this early evolution, B12 drives lipid peroxidation to ensure reproductive success. So that is how our B12 relation with this, which I have not discussed today, seems to be actually pervasive along the evolutionary pathways. And Arnav Mukhopadhyay from National Institute of Immunology in Delhi has published again amazing results about B12 function in C. elegans. So I think this area is picking up. We are getting into molecular biology with exosomes, then various pathways which are involved in different aspects. Finally, if you think you have made some original discovery, then I think you have to ask your wife, okay, do you think actually I am an original sort of person? And my wife actually pointed out this to me. She is a very ardent sort of follower of Vishnu Sahasranam and other things. And in Vishnu Sahasranam Shloka 19 says, Vishnu was like Anur Bruhat. Anu is like small atom, but Bruhat like big Vishal. And he was also Krusha Stulo. Krusha is thin and Stulo is fat. So I have been pipped in this by many thousand years because of this finding. And I think my wife put me in right place. Finally, I will say all this journey has not been easy. When you want to say something provocative, new, disruptive, and you are living in India, it's not very easy to publish it. So Voltaire said this a couple of hundred years ago. He said when he said something new, they said it's not true. But when they realized it is true, they said now it is no more new. So I have faced that again and again, but I was very rewarded in giving a full keynote lecture in Obesity Week just two days ago. And that was a great recognition from the Obesity Society. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop there. Thank you for patiently listening.